This is the town hall of Winchester, Massachusetts, a town formed on July 1st, 1850 from the adjacent towns of Woburn, West Cambridge or Arlington, and Medford. Historically, many New England towns have been named after their settlers' hometowns in Old England. But Winchester, Massachusetts was not named after Winchester, England. It was named after this fellow, Colonel William Parsons Winchester, a wealthy Boston merchant. But who was William Parsons Winchester and what is his story? Fifteen years after the Pilgrims stepped foot on shore in Plymouth, William Parsons Winchester's three times great-grandfather arrived in America. Twenty-four-year-old John Winchester arrived at the port of Boston in April 1635 from Lyd, County Kent, in England. A year later, he received a five-acre land grant in Hingham, Massachusetts. Two years later, he married Hannah Seelis at Situate in Plymouth Colony. Twelve years after arriving, John Sr. moved his family to the Muddy River District of Boston, now called Brookline. There, in 1657, he bought a 140-acre farm. John Sr. served the village of Muddy River as surveyor and tithing man. William's two times great-grandfather, John Winchester Jr., the first son of John Winchester Sr., was born in 1643. Like his father, John Jr. was both a farmer and a civic-minded citizen. He served as a selectman, surveyor, constable, and assessor. In 1705, John Winchester Jr. was a signatory to the petition to have Muddy River incorporated as the town of Brookline. He was the first representative of Brookline to the general court, serving a term of five years. Stephen Winchester, the youngest son of John Winchester Jr., was born in 1685. During his early years, Stephen worked on the family farm in Brookline. By 1720, Stephen had accumulated the financial wherewithal to buy farmland that was formerly part of the Governor Haynes Farm in Newton. Stephen was one of the first settlers on this tract, which now lies southwest of Newton Highlands. In August of 1723, Stephen's wife Hannah gave birth to their firstborn son, Stephen Winchester, Jr., who would be William Parsons Winchester's grandfather. When Stephen Winchester, Jr. was 27 years of age, his father and mother gave him 57 acres of their farm. Stephen, Jr. had nine children by his first wife, Beulah, before she died at the age of 36. To provide for his growing family, Stephen Jr. purchased an additional 72 acres in Newton from John Hammond, enlarging the Winchester family farm to 129 acres. Stephen Winchester Jr.'s farm occupied a plot of land in the southwestern section of Newton Highlands. The approximate northern boundary of the farm is today's Boylston Street, or Route 9. The eastern boundary is Winchester Street, and the southern boundary is South Meadowbrook. The western boundary is approximately present-day Elliott Street. First a railroad, and now Needham Street, bisect the old Winchester family farm. Like his ancestors, Stephen Winchester Jr. did his civic duty as a Newton selectman, and he also served in the Revolutionary War. Stephen married Hannah Aspinwall in 1764. Over the next 11 years, Stephen and Hannah had seven children. The two youngest Winchester sons were Amasa, William's uncle, and Edmund, William's father. When Stephen died in the summer of 1798, he was the fifth largest landowner in the town of Newton. Stephen's will stipulated that Amasa was to receive the 151-acre farm with all its buildings, 
worth in today's money about six and one half million dollars and was to provide for his mother as long as she lived. Edmund was given $1,000, worth almost $1 million today. Present-day Newton has reminders of the Winchester family. Winchester Street is a major thoroughfare connecting Newton Highlands with points south. Old Winchester Street, still a dirt path, leads to the high ground where Stephen Winchester had his farmhouse and barn. In 1796, Edmund Winchester married Prudence Skillings of Boston, and they moved to Boston's North End into a rented house at the end of today's Richmond Street. William Winchester, their first son, was born in this little two-story house. It would be his home until he married 21 years later. From the beginning, the Winchester family's wealth came from their land and a successful farming operation. After the Revolutionary War, huge economic opportunities beyond the traditional farms opened up for any citizen with entrepreneurial skills. Over the next half century, Edmund Winchester, along with his brother Amasa, and later his son William, would go on to build a multi-million dollar provision and soap manufacturing business. At the age of 24, Edmund Winchester took his $1,000 bequest from his father and moved to Boston's North End, on the corner of today's Parmenter and Hanover Streets. Edmund rented a two-story wooden house with 412 square feet and 15 windows. By the fall of 1797, Edmund Winchester had established a business at store number 14 on Codman's Wharf, selling candles along with beef and pork packed in barrels. Edmund's store on Codman's Wharf was a red brick building that he shared with another vendor. In those days, Edmund butchered animal carcasses, which he probably bought at one of the abattoirs in Brighton, and packed the meat in barrels for shipment. Edmund was one of the early U.S. government contractors. The U.S. Navy was a major customer, and in 1798, he was paid the equivalent of two and one half million dollars for sundry provisions and supplies for the frigate Constitution. By 1800, Edmund's business was booming. In October of that year, Edmund announced that he and his brother, Amasa Winchester, had formed a partnership called the E&A Winchester Company. The provision business formed by the brothers was said to be the only one of its kind in early New England. Mess beef is what we would now call corned beef. It was fresh beef packed with alternating layers of salt in a barrel. The salt was the size of corn kernels, hence the name corned beef. Packing meat in salt was the only practical method of meat preservation before the invention of refrigeration. In advertisements of the day, the abbreviation hog was used to describe the quantity of meat. It has nothing to do with the pig and is short for hog's head, which was a large barrel of about 63 gallons. A byproduct of butchering meat was the fat or tallow that was processed into both candles and soap. The profits of the Edmund and Amasa partnership were not equally shared. According to their early ledger, Edmund got three-fifths and Amasa got two-fifths. By the late 1810s, 
the center of meatpacking was shifting west away from New England. Cincinnati, Ohio, soon to be known as Porkopolis, would become the dominant pork packing city. Aware that the meatpacking industry was shifting away from Boston, Edmund Winchester decided to expand his business into candle and soap manufacturing. In June of 1819, the Winchester Partnership paid over two million dollars, in today's money, for three and one-third acres at Leachmere Point, now known as East Cambridge. On that plot of land, bordering the Miller River, they started building a soap and candle making factory. In the early 1820s, Boston was growing rapidly, both in population and land area. To service this growth, more market space was needed. Under Mayor Josiah Quincy, the Faneuil Hall Marketplace project was started in 1824. Since the project required filling Boston Harbor and making dry land from Codman's Wharf, the Winchester Company had to move their provision business to 9 Exchange Street. Once Faneuil Hall Marketplace was completed, Codman's Wharf and the surrounding water would be terra firma and the Winchester's old store would have been under the dome of the Marketplace building. In 1821, at the age of 20, William Winchester became a partner in the new company of E, A, and W Winchester. A new profit-sharing arrangement gave Edmund 45%, Amasa 30%, and William 25%. At the time William joined the company, the factory at 40 Water Street was completed and production of Winchester soap and candles commenced. Even by today's standards, the five-story meandering factory with several chimneys was an imposing structure. It consisted of 12 brick and wooden buildings, each with a different function in the soap and candle making process. Soap and candle making was not the only commerce conducted at the Leachmere Point factory. The Winchester provision business also operated there. Meat was smoked and packed in barrels made by their small cooperage. With a staff of men and boys, the cooperage manufactured 9,000 beef barrels a year. After 13 years in operation, the E.A. and W. Winchester factory in Cambridge was a thriving manufacturing operation. Their soap and candle products were sold throughout the U.S., Asia, the Caribbean, and South America, generating a profit of about 22 million in today's dollars. Today, the long gone Winchester Soap Factory at 40 Water Street has been replaced by a modern office condo complex. Remnants of the old Lowell Railroad line that ran adjacent to the factory are still visible. By 1826, the Faneuil Hall Marketplace project with its north and south markets was complete. Winchester's provision store moved into number 33 South Market Street from their temporary Exchange Street location. Their provision store at 33 South Market Street was near the end of a long row of stores. A few years later, the Winchesters moved the store to number 15, closer to the market entrance for better sales opportunities.
Almost 200 years after the Winchesters moved their business to Quincy Market, the shops are still in use. As late as 1969, there were numerous meat markets occupying the same locations. Today, Old Store Number 15 is shared by the Godiva Chocolatier and a walkthrough. To say the Winchesters were smart businessmen is perhaps an understatement. The Winchester firm was equivalent to the great Chicago meatpacking houses of today. It has been said that the price of a pig could not be fixed in Cincinnati, Ohio without William P. Winchester's consent. This statement is a testament to the Winchester's business acumen and their marketing power. At the age of 21, William Winchester married 20-year-old Eliza Gill Bradley in Boston. William and Eliza were married on October 17, 1822 by the Reverend Nathaniel Frothingham at First Church on Chauncey Street in Boston. Before his marriage to Eliza, William Winchester became a partner in E.A. and W. Winchester Company. At that time, there was also a distant cousin named William Winchester who lived in Boston. To avoid confusion in his business dealings, William petitioned the Massachusetts legislature to change his name to William Parsons Winchester. On February 8, 1823, William Winchester officially became William Parsons Winchester. Thomas Bradley, William's very wealthy father-in-law, was extremely fond of his daughter's new husband. He showed his fondness by purchasing a house at 20 Franklin Place for the newlyweds. The price tag was equivalent of six and one half million dollars. Franklin Place, also known as Tontine Crescent, was designed and built in the late 18th century by the famous Boston architect Charles Bullfinch. Two of the more famous Bullfinch buildings are the Massachusetts State House and the U.S. Capitol. Tontine Crescent on the south side of Franklin Place was a three-story crescent-shaped townhouse building 480 feet long. The Crescent housed the Massachusetts Historical Society and the Boston Library Society on the two floors above the portal. The north side of Franklin Place, opposite Tontine Crescent, comprised four double houses, numbers 17 through 24. Wealthy merchants, bankers, and painters lived on Franklin Place, and in the day, it was the place to live in Boston. At the east end of Franklin Place, the first Boston theater was built, making Franklin Place both a social and cultural mecca of the day. William and Eliza's home at 20 Franklin Place was a three-story brick building of 4,000 square feet with 33 windows. It was one of the largest of the four double houses built by Bullfinch. The house must have been a constant hive of activity. The Winchesters raised seven children with the help of a live-in household staff of six during the 27 years they lived in the house. Franklin Place was also the home William P. Winchester loved most. Both the house and the hosts were well known in the Winchester's social circle for lavish entertaining. The Winchesters reluctantly moved from Franklin Place when the growing Boston Commercial Center expanded into the neighborhood. Edmund Winchester was described as a man of liberal views and great natural talent. Being a successful businessman, he was active in the civic life of Boston. In the political realm, Edmund was a representative for Boston in the Massachusetts General Court from 1819 to 
to 1821. He stood for another term in 1822, but was not seated. Edmund became a director of the Merchants Bank of Boston a few short years after the bank was incorporated in 1831. He remained a director until his son, William, took his seat in 1838. In those days, to be a director, you had to provide capital for the bank. At the equivalent capitalization of $600 million, the Merchants Bank was the largest Boston bank of its day. Banking was just one way wealthy businessmen could invest their money. Edmund Winchester died May 7, 1839, at the age of 67 years. Massa Winchester, William Winchester's uncle and a partner in the Winchester Company, was less prominent than Edmund and also more retiring, but he followed in the civic-minded footsteps of his ancestors. For Amasa, though, politics and finance weren't of great importance. Music was. Amasa was known as a diplomatic and generous person and one who ceaselessly promoted the culture of music in Boston. His musical knowledge was self-taught and extensive. Amasa, a choir director and singer, was a member of both the Massachusetts Musical Society and the Philharmonic Society. Amasa's greatest and most lasting accomplishment was being one of the four founders of the Handel and Haydn Society, named after the famous composers George Friedrich Handel and Joseph Haydn. The Society was chartered in 1816 for the purpose of extending the knowledge and improving the style of performance of church music. During its early decades, the Handel and Haydn Society held its performances on the third floor of the old Boylston Market. Also, in the Society's early years, Amasa served as president, vice president, and trustee. In those days, the president was also the official conductor and music director, but did little actual conducting. One of the few criticisms of the Mass's tenure as president of the society was his reported musical shortcomings. But he was also credited as being one of the best presidents the society has ever had. In 1828, when Amasa ceased to be an active officer of the society, he received high praise from the board of directors. Over 200 years after its founding, the Handel and Haydn Society is still a vibrant Boston cultural organization. Amasa would be pleased. Amasa Winchester died on December 18, 1846, at the age of 71. William Parsons Winchester represented a new generation of the successful family. He was quite wealthy, owning a thriving soap and candle factory and a provisions business, in addition to millions of dollars of inherited money from his wife's family. Where William was educated is unknown, but he was an accomplished scholar in French, Spanish, and Italian. The board payments listed in the Winchester Company ledger for the equivalent of $3,000 per week suggests that William either went to a boarding school or was privately tutored. Today, we would say that he had a high school education. In William's time, only lawyers, theologians, and doctors went to college. William Parsons Winchester was highly regarded for his shrewd business ability and public spirit. He served as a director on the boards of several businesses and civic organizations. Although William was not politically inclined like his father Edmund, in 1842 he was on the Republican ticket for a Senate seat in the Massachusetts legislature. He was not elected, 
probably to his everlasting relief. William Parsons Winchester was human after all. In April of 1843, he and his brother-in-law John R. Bradley went to see a Mr. Charles H. Peabody, the editor of a newspaper called the Weekly Bulletin. Peabody had printed an article about the recent marriage of William's daughter Mary called Marriage in High Life, which William found totally offensive. After not receiving a satisfactory explanation from Peabody as to why he published the article, according to the court transcript, Mr. Winchester struck Peabody several blows, knocking him down on the floor, striking him several times while lying prostrate. Peabody was quite ill for several months after the attack and had to give up his editorship. He went to England for a short time and then returned to Boston. Upon his return, Peabody filed a lawsuit for libel and assault against William Winchester and John Bradley. After a trial held in November the following year, the jury found William guilty and awarded damages equivalent to $46,000 today. John Bradley was acquitted. As part of being a Boston elite, William bought a proprietorship in the Boston Athenaeum. The Athenaeum was a private gentleman's library offering access to collections of books, periodicals, paintings, and sculpture. Membership was strictly limited, and it cost William the equivalent of about $125,000 for proprietorship number 171. William was a discriminating judge and liberal patron of the arts. He bought paintings during his travels to Europe and on his provision buying journeys for the Winchester Company. As a proprietor of the Athenaeum, William could display and sell his paintings at their annual exposition of paintings and statuary. Today, over 200 years later, the Boston Athenaeum is still a private library, museum, and historical archive, but it is now open to all. Like his uncle Amasa, William was both enthusiastically fond of music and a generous financial supporter. Music played a role in his home at 20 Franklin Place, for in June of 1833, a new Chickering Square Grand Piano worth $116,000 was delivered to his home. This top-of-the-line piano had a magnificent rosewood case with four stately pillars as legs and two pedals. By the early 1840s, William started a piano-making business on Washington Street in Boston. He must have thought his pianos competitive, for in 1850, he entered a seven-octave square grand piano in a juried exhibition. He did not win any medals, and by the late 1850s, the firm was out of business. Known as a warm-hearted, open-handed, and generous gentleman, William was, not surprisingly, exceedingly popular. Eliza and William were known to entertain in magnificent style in their 20 Franklin Place home. There were often elaborate and elegant dinner parties and gatherings of William's business and social friends. William P. Winchester seemed to live in the shadow of his father until Edmund died in 1836. After his father's death, William became the senior partner in the Winchester Company and received his father's considerable interest in it. This newly acquired wealth enabled William to partake in expensive leisure activities. One of the more expensive avocations that William pursued and in fact helped create was yachting. He learned sailing at an early age but it wasn't until he was 33 years old that he bought his first sailboat. Purchased in 1836 from Benjamin Clark, the sailboat was called the Mermaid. Three years after he bought the Mermaid, William commissioned the design and building of a custom yacht. He chose an unknown Danish marine architect, Louis Wind, who had some revolutionary design ideas. In later years, Lewis Wind and his family would live in the town of Winchester. For William, Wind planned and built a schooner yacht that was both groundbreaking in hull design and a work of art. It was called the Northern Light 
and was commissioned in July of 1839. The sailing schooner Northern Light was a substantial craft. At 62 feet long with a 17.5 foot beam, it displaced 70 tons. Its most striking visual feature was the paint colors. A black hull with a crimson stripe and an on-deck color scheme of buff and green. She is constructed of oak and is copper fastened and coopered up to the bends, which are painted black and around the edges of which is a red molding. She has a large and beautiful cabin which is fitted up in splendid style. It contains four berths and two staterooms, with a berth in each appropriate for the ladies. The forecastle contains four berths and cooking apparatus. William Parsons Winchester. Shortly after the Northern Light hit the water, it earned a well-deserved reputation as the fastest yacht on Massachusetts Bay and was called the Queen of the Boston Fleet. As a gentleman of the day, racing his yacht was not particularly important to William, but he did not ignore a challenge. Before 1845, yacht racing, or regatta, was not an organized sport. During that summer, the first regatta in Massachusetts Bay was held off Nahant on the North Shore. Boston Harbor, even then, was judged too congested for yacht racing. Nahant was a summer playground with a grand hotel that provided a respite from the sultry Boston summer for those with a financial wherewithal. It had an expansive view of the Atlantic and was connected to Boston by regular steamboat service, an ideal spot to watch a regatta. One of William Winchester's contributions to yachting culture was the costume. Its purpose was to keep his guests' shore clothes clean and to please the captain. The sailing costume on the Northern Light was a red flannel shirt, white trousers, and a straw hat with a one yard long silk ribbon around the crown. William's other contribution to yachting culture was the introduction of free-handed hospitality. An important component of this hospitality was the much talked about drink called bimbo. A combination of brandy, lemons, and water, it had a reputation for creeping up on the imbiber. In 1847, William Winchester sold the Northern Light into use as a passenger packet boat between Boston and Provincetown. After a season away from sailing, William bought the Northern Light back in the fall of 1848 over the winter, he refitted it to its original condition in time for the 1849 sailing season. At the end of 1849, William sold the Northern Light for the last time. The new owners refitted for a cruise going around the tip of South America to California. The Northern Light left Boston for the last time in December of 1850. By March, she was wrecked on her way through the Magellan Straits. The many friends of William Winchester who had partaken of his hospitality on the yacht put up a fund to purchase an appropriate expression of their thanks. They commissioned Jones, Ball and Poor, a predecessor to today's Shreve, Crump and Lowe, to make a punch bowl. The bowl cost $1,000 and was presented to William in the spring of 1850. The inscription on the punch bowl reads, presented to William P. Winchester to commemorate the pleasant hours his friends have passed with him on board his yacht, Northern Light. In 1901, the punch bowl was given to the town of Winchester by William's son, Thomas Winchester. Today, it is on display in the town library. In 1831, 
William Parsons Winchester was admitted as a member of the Independent Corps of Cadets. The Corps of Cadets started as the bodyguard of the Massachusetts Royal Governor. In William's time, the Corps of Cadets was a combination training, parade, and social organization. William was classified as a fine member. As a fine member, he was allowed to attend social events, but was excused from military duties upon payment of a fine or assessment. On October 12, 1842, William was elected as the 30th commanding officer of the Independent Corps of Cadets. His rank as a commanding officer was Lieutenant Colonel in the Massachusetts Militia. One week after his election as commanding officer, Colonel Winchester led the Independent Corps of Cadets in parade. At the conclusion of the parade, the cadets adjourned to the Colonel's house on Franklin Street for sumptuous entertainment. In 1843, the Colonel announced that he would take a furlough and travel for a year in Europe, leaving that July. On a July 4th cruise with the cadets aboard the Northern Light, the Colonel was surprised by two magnificent bon voyage gifts. A silver pitcher and a salver were presented to the Colonel by the cadets. The inscription on the picture reads, presented to Colonel William Winchester by the Independent Company of Cadets on this eve of his departing for Europe. The salver, also crafted by Lowe's Ball and Company, carried the Cadet Corps unit insignia along with the inscription, Lieutenant Colonel William P. Winchester, Boston, July 4, 1843. By the end of July, the Colonel his son William Winchester Jr. and his wife Eliza sailed from Boston for Europe. Colonel Winchester kept a journal long since lost during this European trip, but a transcription of two entries survives. Saturday, December 30, 1843, was presented this evening at 9 at the Palace of the Tuileries to the King of the French, Louis Philippe and the Queen of France, Amélie, by Mr. Ledyard, the Charge de Fer, in company with 50 Americans. I was in a new cadet uniform and introduced as Lieutenant Colonel Winchester, commander of the bodyguard of the Governor of Massachusetts. The King asked me what corps I commanded, and I replied as above. He then said, it was a post of great honor. I said in reply, I appreciate it as such, Your Majesty. Tuesday, January 2nd, 1844. Afterwards, attended the grand reception at the Palace of the Tuileries. There were, it was supposed, 2,000 persons present, ladies and gentlemen. The King, Louis Philippe, the Queen, and the Royal Family were present. After the ladies were presented, the gentlemen paid their respects to the King, Queen, and Royal Family. I was introduced to the King as Colonel Winchester. The King asked me if I was from Boston. I replied, yes, your majesty, from Boston, Massachusetts. I bowed to the Queen, which was returned promptly. The Duc de Noumois asked me as follows, uh, what uniform is it, sir, that you wear? I replied, the uniform of the Independent Corps of Cadets of Boston, the bodyguard of the governor of Massachusetts. He immediately replied, it is a splendid uniform, sir. I bowed to the Duke for the compliment, thanking His Highness for his good opinion of it, and retired, much gratified. William Parsons Winchester. On June 20, 1844, Colonel Winchester had his son, William Jr., returned to Boston from his European tour. His wife, Eliza, had returned the previous November. By July, the Colonel had resigned as the company commander of the Independent Corps of Cadets. However, in 1846, during the Mexican-American War, the Colonel offered his services to the Governor to form a company of 100 men and proceed in a vessel of his own to Texas. Since there was no need for the Massachusetts militia, the Governor declined the Colonel's offer. 
portrait of Colonel Winchester in his military regalia is preserved in the Museum of the Veterans Association, First Corps of Cadets in Boston's Back Bay. The Independent Corps of Cadets survives to this day as the 211th Military Police Battalion of the Massachusetts Army National Guard. In the mid-1840s, Boston's commercial district was encroaching on the Colonel's beloved home on Franklin Street. In 1845, Colonel Winchester started buying land in Watertown for a country estate. Within a year, he accumulated 25 contiguous acres on the Charles River in the southeast portion of the town, adjacent to the Cambridge Cemetery. One of the reasons for buying land on a waterway was so the Colonel could sail his yacht right up to his front door. For his architect, the Colonel selected Arthur Gilman, who had designed the Winchester family tomb in Mount Auburn Cemetery a few years earlier. Colonel Winchester's estate was named Fern Hill. The mansion, designed by Gilman, had a brick exterior whose architectural style has been described as being more in character with Georgian neoclassicism. A magnificent porch ran along the west side of the mansion and provided a stunning view of the Charles River the Colonel's boathouse, and the setting sun. The completed Fern Hill consisted of a two-story mansion, a large stable, bowling alley, boathouse, and other buildings. The mansion, finished in early 1850, was quite large, and it was said that it could hold an entire regiment of soldiers in the main hall. Although this statement is no doubt exaggerated, the footprint of the house was 65 feet wide by 125 feet at its deepest. The main section of the mansion was about 65 feet square. The exquisite neoclassical boathouse, also designed by Gilman, stood on a bend in the Charles River just below the mansion. To celebrate his new home, the Colonel threw a big July 4th party. This party would be the last big social event for the Colonel. Fern Hill was sold by the Winchesters in 1872. In 1885, the property was annexed by the city of Cambridge to expand the Cambridge Cemetery to the southwest. The Fern Hill outbuildings were torn down in 1893, and three years later, the mansion also succumbed to the wrecking ball. Before May of 1850, the northern part of Winchester, Massachusetts was known as South Woburn. To the south and southeast, parts of Medford and Arlington also became Winchester. When you create a town, you need a name. Some of the names proposed for the new town were Appleton, Avon, Channing, Columbia, Waterville, and Winthrop. But none of them generated much enthusiasm within the town naming committee. Frederick O. Prince, a lawyer and leading citizen who recently moved to South Woburn from Boston, put forth the name Winchester. Prince had conducted business with the Colonel, so he was well aware of Colonel William Winchester's generosity. Prince convinced the Colonel to give the town $3,000 in thanks for selecting his family name for the town. On April 30th, 1850, the governor signed legislation that incorporated the town of Winchester. After the incorporation, the colonel was scheduled to attend a town meeting where his thank you letter was to be read. But on that day, a violent rainstorm prevented him from attending. To Mr. Nathan B. Johnson, Loring Emerson, Charles McIntyre, Selectman of Winchester. Gentlemen, I'm informed that the name Winchester was given to your town 
at the request of its inhabitants, in compliment to me. No compliment could be more flattering, and I beg leave through you to return my cordial thanks, therefore. But as I am not content with a mere verbal expression of the high honor conferred upon my family name, I beg leave to present to the town the enclosed sum of $3,000 to be appropriated to the re erection of a town hall or any other proper object of municipal expenditure. With my best wishes for a lasting prosperity of the town of Winchester and its citizens, believe me, very truly, your obedient servant, William P. Winchester. On August 6, 1850, at the age of 49, Lieutenant Colonel William Parsons Winchester died in his Watertown home of typhoid fever, complicated by other diseases. He never set foot in the town that now bears his name. Colonel Winchester is buried in the Winchester family tomb on Narcissus Path in Mount Auburn Cemetery. It wasn't until 37 years after the town was formed that a magnificent town hall was built. Part of the Colonel's original $3,000 gift was used to purchase a clock and bell for the tower. There you have it, the story of the man who is the namesake of our town. 24 times a day, every day of the year, our town's clock tower bell reminds us of Colonel William Parsons Winchester and his generosity to future generations. <laughs>